why I think we're getting thousands and thousands of people waking up and saying, yes, the government can't take care of me from cradle to grave, because what does government have? They produce nothing. All they can do is steal from one group and give it to another, and that destroys wealth. That does not produce wealth. So the opportunity has presented itself, and the numbers are growing, and we have sort of certain, uh, different groups coming together. I have met so many, and I've known them personally, and I knew of it in the 50s and the 60s of a few individuals who knew what was coming. Even during the uh, days of, um, of FDR, when they saw uh, these problems coming, but it was a small number of people. They would write and study and try to keep hold people together this understanding and to me it reminds me of the remnant that is the Old Testament. There's always somebody in society that will hold the truths together. Even in the Soviet system, when you think of Solzhenitsyn, he was born at the time of the revolution. He grew up under his Soviet dictatorship. And here was a man that was educated, spoke fluent English, read the classics, and wrote, and he would, and, and, and he was raised under this tyrant, under this tyranny of communism. So he was part of a remnant that existed even in the Soviet system. And in this country, we have many that belong, and the Old Testament teaches us those people who cling to truth are not known. We don't even know our numbers. All I know is I see a remnant growing by leaps and bounds, people who have been frustrated over the years and saying, the time has come. said that when the time has come, an idea whose time has come, even the armies of big governments cannot stop an idea whose time has come. But it isn't only the remnant had been holding this together. There were only a few think tanks that thought this way over many decades. But there are many now. There are many professors now teaching this. There's a and there's a growing interest, but the exciting part for me is a whole generation of young people now are studying and they're excited about what true liberty is all about. For a long time, we uh, sort of took it on the chin by those who want to take care of all the poor, and they say, we are the ones who care about people. And they grabbed the moral high ground, and uh, those of us who believe in the markets didn't do a very good job. Because if we truly are humanitarians, if we truly want to help people, we don't do it through authoritarianism of government. You have to do it through volunteerism and productivity, enthusiasm and self-reliance and sound money, a strictly limited government that protects the liberty. That is what, that's what really counts. And this is what I think people are starting to realize because this system is now known to be failing. And that is the reason people coming together and more aware of how serious this problem is. Let me tell you, a group like this, you are way ahead of my colleagues in Washington, D.C. <laughs> frustrated because they say, well, yes, we're a number, our numbers are growing, uh, I'm doing well in the campaign, but you don't, we don't have 51% of the country. I mean, they do a poll, well, does 51% of the country now endorse what we say and do and want to uh, want, believe in? No, but what is taught about ideas, how they have consequences, the 51% are usually just followers. They come along. 51% are usually ones that will call you because they know you're interested in politics. But most people go to the polls the day or two before and they wonder what's going on at the last minute. So it is you, the people who care and understand that are in that minority. It is an irate, tireless minority that uh, Samuel uh, Adams used to talk about. He would say, that is the group that has to drive it. And then people in special places, people who are in that group can lead others. And this is where our numbers are growing by leaps and bounds. And the uh, failure of the system, plus this enthusiasm for something that made America great, and they can see this,
And it's not like we have to invent anything new. We can improve upon it. We can. I never, I always resent it when people will write articles. May, may I understand it because I think they do it from uh, not understanding what economics and freedom is all about. But they'll say, oh, people, Ron Paul wants to go back to the 19th century and go back and, and you know, something old and ancient. But let me tell you what's old and ancient. That's tyranny. That's been around way too long. Most of the world today is being run by tyrants, and uh, and this this is quite a bit different. So the experiment that we had worked very well, but then we got careless. I believe we got careless because we were tempted by the material abundance. So we have freedom, and we have the incentive. We have a good system. It produces tremendous wealth, and then we concentrate on the material abundance, and we don't think about where the material abundance comes from, and think that you know that you can. Uh, uh, spend forever. Sometimes people who in in inherit a lot of money or some people who are successful and get millions and millions of dollars, but they, they don't understand where it came from. They can get careless and they lose it all. I think we as a nation tended to do that, that we concentrate on that. And what did that invite? It invited business people more to, to invest more money in lobbyists than in R&D and developing new products and being competitive around the world because they went to Washington and they took over. So in understanding that, we, we can challenge all this, but we have to convince people that it is in their best interest. They may not think about this deeply, but they know superficially that, that, uh, that we have to, it has to be in their best interest. And right now, the people are saying that the programs that we have in Washington, the spending is not in their best interest. It's, it's dangerous. And they have now come to the conclusion, although it's been a long s struggle, convince the majority of the American people it is not in our best interest to be involved these in endless wars that have been undeclared or unwinnable and they ought to end. The opportunity right now that we have, it's, uh, it's expressed in this campaign. Uh, we don't know how much time it will be before we go over the cliff and really cause a great deal of political problems for ourselves. It could be in six months, it could be in six years. I think it's moving along rather rapidly. But we see it happening around the world already. Yeah, I mean, take a country like Greece. They know that they, they went way too far and they have to cut back. When they cut back, people, people have been taught for so long to be totally dependent. They get very angry. There's demonstrations in the streets that, and they will become violent. So this is the reason that we have to head it off before we get to that point. And also uh, the, the fact that that is a danger makes me very much concerned about the undermining of our civil liberties and our due process of law in this country. This is very dangerous. fearful either from a, 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 an enemy that uh, people describe, even if it's pretend. Just think of all the fear mongering that occurred and why we had to go to war against Iraq because they were about to attack us with a nuclear weapon and Al-Qaeda was there. None of that was true. It was, at 9-11, 9-11 was used as an excuse to do something they wanted to do, have done for many, many years. proposing certain types of legislation that would invade our privacy, undermine the Fourth Amendment, and they couldn't get it passed. But guess what? 9-11 came and passed quickly two weeks later called the Patriot Act. No. The one thing that the Patriot Act is not, it is not patriotic. <laughs> Matter, matter of fact, the only thing that we should do about the Patriot Act is repeal it. That's what we ought to do. When that, bill, when that bill was on the floor, we had, even though the bill had been floating around, the final version arrived at the floor in the aftermath of 9 11.
seven and uh, an hour debate. It was just, you know, sort of automatic. And the, the uh, congressman that was sitting next to me, he was voting for it. And I said, why are you voting for this? You don't even know what's in it. He says, I know. I said, there could be some bad stuff in there, don't you know? He said, yeah, I know that. And I said, well, why don't you vote against it? He says, how can I vote against the Patriot Act and go back home and explain it to my constituents? I said, well, that's what your job is, to go home and explain it to them. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but the one thing that, if you look at the name of a bill that comes out of Congress, you can almost always assume it's opposite of what the title tells you it's going to do. <laughs> a, little, a little bit of deception there. So can, can you imagine if they'd have only called it repeal the Fourth, uh, Fourth Amendment Act, how many people could have voted for it? So when we, make, uh, when we make the bill to repeal the Patriot Act, we should call it Restore the Fourth Amendment Act. <laughs> deeply undermined our privacy. There's no doubt, no doubt about it, because that was a major issue for the founders and then after the revolution to put that in, because it was the British involvement of going into the houses and looking at the papers and looking for whether or not they bought, uh, bought their stamps and paid their taxes, but they would come in and they'd stay in their houses, no search warrants, and, and just total abuse. But this is what's happening to us in America. Today, whether it's a combination of the of the drug war or the combination of uh, the Patriot Act or the atmosphere, the houses are being broken into rather routinely. And at all levels of government, we have these SWAT teams going in, and unfortunately, many, many times they're going in and they're going to try to find out if somebody's using an illegal drug. And they go in there and people die. They don't even show the the, the uh, uh, search warrant because they don't get them and they get to write them. The person breaking into the houses get to write their own search warrants. This was the kind of thing that we had a revolution about. And it's also, this particular act is what uh, allows uh, the ruthlessness of how we're treated at airports. If we stand by and say that we can have elderly people undressed and children molested and X-ray top to bottom, and certain people run through the X-ray two or three times. Tell you, if we can look at those X-rays on TV and say, oh, well, I guess we have to give up a little bit of our liberty to be safe, then there's something wrong with us, and we need to change. the president sent somebody over to testify before a Senate hearing and explain a new position he held. And he said that he has this authority because it's no, not prohibited by the Constitution. So he buys in, the president buys in this argument that if it's not prohibited by the Constitution, he's allowed to do anything he wants. But it's written the other way. The only thing the president is allowed to do are those things that he has given explicit permission to do. tell the people, and there was not much of an outcry by the American people, but he said that it is now an official policy of the United States that he can direct the assassination of an American citizen. No charges made, no trial, maybe a bad person. You know, bad people are supposed to have trials too, so that if we ever get accused of anything, that we get a trial. Everybody deserves a trial. Even yeah. Timothy McVeigh, these people get trials. Point, to this point, he has now assassinated three American citizens. And um, one happened to be the 16-year-old son of a guy that was accused, of, uh, not, you know, at least thought to be a pretty bad guy. The 16-year-old kid I barbecued in his backyard. It, he was an ally of the father, so to speak. But that is not what made America great. That's not why we were the freest and the most prosperous country in, in the world. And th th those kind of things can't stand. But even the Congress doesn't help much at all. The president assumes these, re the, assumes these uh, powers but the Congress delivered more powers to him on a platter, and the president thought that's the way he would break in the new year. It was on New Year's Day that he signed the National Defense Authorization Act. <coughs> oh. 
This means that he's repealing the uh, posse comitatus, that he has said that American, uh, Americans be, uh, can be arrested, not by the local policeman that's supposed to be in charge of that or the local sheriff, but the, the army, the military can come in and make arrests. That was one of the main reasons why there was a revolution between the Texans and the Mexicans, Mexico, because that's what they started doing, and the Texans didn't like that. And uh, we shouldn't like it either if our government's going to arrest American citizens by the military. They're denied a trial. They're denied an attorney. And they can be put in a secret prison, and they can be sent out of the country to a secret prison. Well, have they done it very often? We don't know how many times. They have done it a few times. But it's the process. It's the standard is, is so important. So if, we, if a country gets into chaos, they say, well, that's the law. That's the law of the land. There was one provision put in that bill that was even more atrocious. But th that provision said, that if you were arrested, and you were charged, and you were tried, and found innocent, if the government found, that, if the federal government decided that they still wanted to arrest you again and put you in prison for life in a secret prison, they still could do it even if you were found to be innocent by a jury. Oh. Now, that was in the bill, but there was a young senator from Kentucky who was oh. able to... Yeah. We had heard about that at the last minute because they sort of tried to slide these things down. He ran down to the Senate floor and insisted a vote came up on this. And he won the vote. A lot of people who were supporting the bill, they said, well, we didn't know it was in there. They probably didn't know it was in there. That's the, that's the tragedy of all that goes on in Washington. So much gets put in. They get put in in conferences. They get put in by staff people. And it's very difficult. This is why I generally have stayed out of trouble in Washington. Because uh, not that I knew everything in a bill. It's just that I had a strong sense of... Uh, of uh, suspicion, suspicion about them that if I found one little thing wrong, the safest vote then, if you were suspicious of it, the vote was no. <laughs> economic problems and uh, free markets could settle those. A sound monetary system could sound, solve our monetary problems. And un a health and respect for civil liberties, understanding where our lives and our liberties come from. And uh, all in the Constitution, having constitutionalists, that would solve that problem. And then also, if we had uh, a constitutional foreign policy of a strong national defense, at the same time, not believing that we should be the policemen of the world and that believing in occupation. And uh, this, this would, you know, essentially solve, solve our problems. Not a perfect world, but we're moving in the wrong direction right now. But for me, the issue is this individual liberty, you know, how, how freedom for the individual brings people together. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, something that happened at the same time 100 years ago. Our country sort of lost this concept of freedom being one unit, economic freedom and social and individual freedom on how we want to run our lives, uh, the right of our uh, to, to have our own religious values and personal values. And so some groups would defend one half of it, and other groups would defend the other half. But it's all one. If it's your life, and you own your life, and it's your liberty, and it should be your property, then freedom should bring us all together. Now, the big problem there is that some people waste their lives, and some people waste their lives in a social sense, and some people waste their lives in an economic sense, and then the do-gooders who like power use that as an excuse for saying, well, he won't take care, and I've had members of Congress tell me this. Well, I said, why are you voting for this? He says, well, the people are too stupid. They won't take care of themselves. So he had to, you, you know, he had to vote to, you know, have another, another program. But th this is this is the whole whole thing. If we can put this all together, what what happens is that people have to assume responsibility. Now, freedom doesn't work if you don't assume responsibility for your behavior. Up 
this notion that uh, we are totally intolerant of other people, how they use their liberties. We generally aren't intolerant of how people use their religious liberties. We let people go to different churches, and if they don't want to go to church, they don't go to church, and we're fairly tolerant of that. But as soon as it comes to other personal habits, and uh, for one group, it'll be personal habits, the other group on economic matters, then they feel compelled that we have to take care of people. We have to be the nanny state. And it never ends. Once we take make this assumption that the government can protect us against ourselves, there is no liberty left. The government is endless in taking away our liberty. is if we can be more tolerant of other people, it doesn't mean that we endorse what they do. And some people think that if you legalize something, if you legalize choice in religion, you don't endorse somebody else's religion. And we don't endorse what you read and, and study intellectually. Why is it if somebody is so overwhelmingly be, being controlled about what we put into our bodies? And you know, just today, I complain about all the things that control, they shouldn't have control over our bodies, you should have control over your bodies. <laughs> just, just today, I think I read it on the internet, a, another, another Amish farmer, he came in and had all his property destroyed and taken from, from him, from the federal government, because he had the audacity to think that he had the right to sell raw milk to his neighbors. I mean, what, what, is, what is going on here? But it's the principle that has to be looked at. If you say, well, we have to have a little bit of control here, a little bit of control here, then you lose control because then the government assumes that they control everything. But these ideas are coming around and people are understanding them. They, they are our solutions. And uh, the, the one part about bringing people together under the issue of, of liberty, it all of a sudden erases the differences among us. It, it, it erases, the, it brings people diverse, you know, who are diverse, bring people together because we shouldn't be challenging each other. But the one thing that has to be done if we're gonna protect liberty, in, in our history, we certainly have had, and we still have remnants of it, of people being attacked and they lose their liberties because they belong to certain groups. Even today, the way the drug laws are being enforced, certain groups get much more punished than other groups on these drug laws, and, and that, as far as I'm concerned, is wrong. But at the same time, you But at the same time, if you shouldn't be punished before, be, uh, you shouldn't uh, be punished because you belong to a group. You shouldn't have any special benefits because you belong to a special group. <laughs> so the solution comes in understanding these principles, and they're not—they're not brand new. They've been around. There is a stronger understanding today of the need for this. There's every reason to be encouraged because of the numbers that are growing and the enthusiasm and the need for this today is bringing more and more people over to our side. So all, all I can say is that uh, if we continue to do this, the, the world will change, this country will change, your life will change, you will have a greater obligation because you have come to a fuller understanding than many, many others out there. So your obligations will be to participate in one way or the other. We hope you participate in this caucus votes and political, but some people don't like that. Sometimes they're teachers, sometimes they get in the media. Who knows, maybe helping candidates, but you always have a responsibility. And it's not because you have to donate yourself or sacrifice yourself. It, this is one time it's okay to do it in your own self-interest. You do this because it's in your interest to live in a free society. It's in your interest to have your family live in a free society. Yeah. Yeah. So I, want, I want to thank you very much for coming out. And if we do our job, we can continue this effort, we can continue this revolution. The revolution, which is an ideological revolution, is alive and well, and I thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this revolution.
Okay, remember to go to your caucuses. Remember to get registered to vote. Sign up on the way out if Dr. Paul convinced you if you didn't sign up on the way in. God bless Dr. Paul. God bless America. And thank you for coming tonight.